Hey, Al Letson here, and we love and value our listeners who tune in every week to hear new stories. And we know that sometimes one episode just isn't enough. That's why we've been so excited to bring you American Rehab, our very first serial. Throughout the last several weeks, we've been sharing what we learned from a three-year investigation into drug and alcohol treatment programs across the country. Every episode takes time and money. Reveal is a nonprofit newsroom supported by listeners like you. If you value the show and are able, please support the work we do with a $9 monthly donation. You'll become a Reveal member and you'll receive our face mask with the word facts on it. Because as a Reveal listener, we know you value getting the facts. To get yours, just text REVEAL to 474747. You can text STOP at any time. Standard data rates apply. Again, that's REVEAL to 474747 to support REVEAL today. And remember, the only way forward is together. When you think of the hills and haulers of Appalachia, most envision rural, rugged, and white. But the new podcast, Black in Appalachia, tells a different story. Through explorations of historical and contemporary events, sociologist Inkeshi el and journalist Angela Dennis discuss migration, politics, emancipation, social justice, and other notions about what it means to be Black in Appalachia. Listen to Black in Appalachia wherever you get your podcasts. From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Edson. It's been nearly three months since George Floyd died in police custody, and the protests are still going strong. I can't breathe. imagine how George felt. He had eight minutes, 46 seconds of a knee on his neck. I can't breathe. 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 In the days right after Floyd's death, Many of the protests focused on one of the most concrete symbols of white supremacy, statues. From small towns to big cities, dozens of statues of segregationists and slave owners, conquistadors and Confederate soldiers have been removed, sometimes by public officials, but sometimes by angry crowds. I'm going to take you now to a live look. This is on Monument Avenue. We were told that the Jefferson Davis statue, as you can see here, has been toppled. Jefferson Davis was the Confederate president. His statue was one of many along a main boulevard in Richmond, Virginia. The city is famous for these statues. They've been a big draw for people who visit the former capital of the Confederacy, sometimes bearing Confederate flags. Now, as these statues are coming down, you'll hear people, including President Trump, continue to defend them. Our nation is witnessing a merciless campaign to wipe out our history defame our heroes, erase our values. But what version of history is being protected and who's paying to keep it alive? Back in 2018, we teamed up with Type Investigations to answer those questions. Reporters Brian Palmer and Seth Fried Wessler visited more than 50 Confederate sites, including another place honoring Jefferson Davis, his former home in Biloxi, Mississippi, an estate called Beauvoir. It's one of the city's most popular attractions, hosting school field trips, tourists, even weddings. As the debate over Confederate monuments heats up, we're going to re-air that story. We begin with Brian and Seth visiting the grounds of Beauvoir in 2018 during its annual fall muster, a mock Civil War battle. Here's Seth. Brian and I decide to take different cars to Beauvoir and spend the next two days reporting separately. As a white reporter, I blend in here, where, aside from some of the school kids, almost everyone is white. It had been like that at more than a dozen other Confederate sites I visited for this story. But for Brian, it was different. As an African-American reporter, I stick out. I feel that people see black before they see anything else. Reporting on our own, we can find out whether people will open up to us differently. Madam, next to that little tree, move back, please. We arrive in time for fall muster. Men dressed in Union and Confederate uniforms line up on either side of a long field. They carry rifles and flags and push cannons into position. Then the fighting begins. Seth is in the middle of all of it. I look around to see who's here. 
500 people, maybe, sit in bleachers or stand nearby. Families with young children carry Confederate flags. Old bearded men wear biker vests with these Sons of Confederate veterans patches sewn on. Two younger men wear army camouflage. Some people want to talk to me. They tell me stories of loyal slaves and so-called black Confederates. I make sure to keep my distance from Seth so he can do his thing and I can do mine. I meet an older couple from Virginia who tell me they drove down to support the flag and celebrate their heritage. They love it here. This is the lady I mentioned. And they want me to meet someone. Her name is Susan Hathaway. She is the founder. (laughs) Hello. Hi. How are you? So I just remind me you're the founder of? The Virginia Flaggers. Oh, wow. The Virginia Flaggers is a group that protests whenever they hear of plans to remove Confederate statues and flags. On the highways, mega battle flags all over Virginia. Anywhere a monument is being debated. And for Hathaway, this place, Beauvoir, is hallowed ground. It's just kind of a holy, holy place for us <laughs> with Confederate ancestry. And um, the things they've done here are just amazing. And to be able to walk where Jefferson Davis walked. Do you think of it that way as a kind Absolutely. of... Absolutely. As a place where we can come and, and express our appreciation and our, our love of our heritage without having anybody to sit here and try to tell us what they think it's about and what we need to do. And if they would just leave us alone, we would um, be fine. Do, um... God save the South! Woo! At this point, I'm kind of at a loss for words. It sounds like she's saying that the federal government should just leave the South alone. As I look around at the crowd, it's clear to me that she's only talking about one part of the South, the white South. We're proud to be Southern. It's like like Southern is the only thing you're not allowed to be proud of anymore. You can be proud to be African-American, you can be proud to be Irish-American, you can be proud, but you can't be proud to be Confederate-American or to say you're even from the South. This is a message Seth and I heard not just here, but at a number of Confederate sites we visited, including a cemetery in Virginia and a library in Alabama. One thing they had in common, the Sons of Confederate Veterans, which also owns Beauvoir. The Sons is a national organization with dozens of chapters founded in 1896. Only male descendants of Confederate veterans can join. The group's mission is to vindicate the cause that Confederates fought for. During the mock battle, we see their version of history play out. Muskets crack, units advance, and men fall down dead in the field. The Confederates beat back the Union troops. No actual Civil War battle took place here. But at Beauvoir, the Confederacy always wins. The next day, Brian and I return to Beauvoir. It's raining hard and the muster is canceled. So we get a chance to interview Thomas Paine, who was then Beauvoir's executive director. His assistant meets us at the door. All right, great. Hey, how are you? Are y'all together? We, we, we operate don't. separately. Oh, okay. We enter Paine's office. Yeah, that rifle right there, that's the oldest thing in here. An old rifle hangs on the wall to his right. Pictures of Confederate leaders are behind him, and a set of three flags, Mississippi, American, and Confederate, are planted on his desk. Payne is a white man in his 60s with a salt-and-pepper mustache. He's a lawyer with a Ph.D. in adult education. He's not a member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, but he tells us he's eligible to be one. He just works for them. It's it's that Beauvoir is not just a place. It's a place in time. You should be feeling like you're actually walking back in time as a witness to what took place. I want this to be an educational institution that tells the truth, and then people will come here know that they can depend on the information that they're getting, good, the bad, and the ugly. We already knew what kind of information Payne was talking about, because the day before our interview, I shelled out my $12.50 to take a tour of the house where Davis lived in his final years. Look at the chairs, how short and close to the ground they are. Donna Barnes is the guide. She wears a full Gone with the Wind dress, and as you'll hear, she has a Scarlett O'Hara view of the Civil War. You look from the wall to the ceiling, 
Looks like some of the most beautiful crown molding, rich with color and beautiful to see. We experience this at site after site, places where Confederate leaders who were slaveholders once lived. Minute details about the furnishings, but near silence about slavery. It's interesting to me that, that that's not built into the tour. Why isn't it? I don't know. I guess because I, you cannot say. I guess because I'd be here all day if I told everything about the Davises. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Donna and I step out, and I ask her how she answers questions from tourists about slavery. I want to tell them the honest truth about it, that slavery was good and bad. It was good for the people that didn't know how to take care of themselves and they needed a job. And you had good slave owners like Jefferson Davis who took care of his slaves and treated them like family. He loved them. They were not family. They were property. Jefferson Davis, who led a would-be nation created to defend slavery, owned dozens of people, black people. And this place, the historic Beauvoir estate, was built with enslaved labor. The idea that Davis's slaves were happy echoes through his memoir, which he wrote in this very house. In speaking about African Americans, he said, their servile instincts rendered them contented with their lot. This idea, which is perhaps too controversial to hang on the walls, still hangs in the air here. And Brian and I encountered it at other Confederate sites we visited, where, to this day, Confederate leaders are portrayed as benign and beloved by those they held in bondage, not only distorting history, but denying the lived experience of millions of enslaved people. My own great-grandparents were among those millions. Both of them, Matt and Julia Palmer, escaped slavery in Virginia. Matt joined the United States Colored Troops, the U.S. Army's segregated black fighting force. Julia and her family fled to Union-held territory. They emancipated themselves, like half a million others before the war's end. We wanted to know why history was still being erased and distorted here. These are the questions we had for Beauvoir's then-executive director, Thomas Paine. I do think we need to talk more about slavery. And the reason I got that was not from, from, other, from the kids. We have a lot of our young kids who come here, and, and they want to know where the whipping post was at. And, and the way we handle that, since they're young kids, we don't have a whipping post. So what I hear him saying is that we can't talk about slavery at all because kids can't handle it. But what about those Civil War battles? We watched a lot of people fall down playing dead in a field. That kind of violence that glorifies the Confederacy is A-OK -okay here. But the violence of slavery, Beauvoir steers clear of that. We're judging a lot of what happened in the 19th century with our 20 and 21st century uh, glasses, so to speak. We're looking through lenses of the 20 and 21st century and saying, oh, that's terrible. We've heard this before. You can't judge slavery by today's standards. But we don't need to. Abolitionists, including the formerly enslaved, argued against the system while it was happening, for the same reason we argue against it today. It was wrong. And yet Payne defends Davis. I think that would be an honest perception that he was a benevolent slaveholder. There's no way to benevolently own another person's body, another person's life, another person's future. That phrase, benevolent slaveholder, is straight-up lost cause language. So here's a term we need to understand. Lost cause. Confederates who lost the war devised this idea of the lost cause. It's a whole false interpretation of history designed to justify their defeat to absolve themselves of any guilt for starting the war, and to vindicate their pre-war way of life. And this story is still being told at Beauvoir. The larger goal of these once powerful men was to end the process that was reordering Southern society, reconstruction. They wanted to redeem their status, their power, and their control over black lives and labor. These fantasies persist because people have to believe they have to believe that they fought for something greater 
than the continued subjugation of another human being. Christy Coleman is a longtime administrator of historic sites, and she's currently the CEO of the American Civil War Museum in Richmond, Virginia. She's an African-American woman, and the center she runs tells a story of the Civil War that's complicated, at times ugly, and it includes the perspectives of African-Americans free and enslaved and of Union and Confederate soldiers. In other words, the full story. It's almost laughable when I read some of these um, diary entries about these owners, <laughs> these slaveholders, who are just so mortified that, well, Jenny's been with me since she was six years old, and the fact that she ran off with those Yankees and da 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 I'm just sure that they, you know, uh, uh, overwhelmed her little fragile mind. But this is the same woman that you've had whipped several times because she has run away on her own long before the war. There was just this cognitive dissonance related to it that is really stunning. You have a narrative that makes people comfortable for the spaces that they're in. We thought a lot about what Christy had to say, that these places are set up to feed on people's ignorance and make them feel comfortable about America's violent and racist past. Comfortable with a false history of America, one that honors the Confederacy and everything it stood for. By now, we'd been digging for months into exactly who runs these sites. But we had another question. Who's paying to keep them open? We filed dozens of public records requests and sifted through piles of tax filings to find out where the money was coming from. And we were stunned by what we were starting to find. Taxpayer money is keeping these places open. And Beauvoir is a huge beneficiary. We tallied all of the public monies Beauvoir says it received from 2007 through 2016. It added up to more than $21 million. More than $21 million, all from taxpayers. We checked, and that money continues to flow today. When we come back, Seth and Brian explain where that money is coming from and how it's being used at Beauvoir and other Confederate sites across the country. That's next on Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX. the way media tiptoes around the subject of race? Well, Code Switch doesn't do that. The weekly podcast from NPR has been talking about how race impacts all aspects of American life for years now. It's made by journalists of color and makes all of us a part of the conversation because we're all a part of the story. Find it where you get your podcasts and join the conversation on NPR's Code Switch. From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Letson. Before the break, we visited Beauvoir, the former home of Confederate leader Jefferson Davis. The property now houses a museum of misinformation about slavery and the Civil War. Reporters Seth Fried Wessler and Brian Palmer of Type Investigations visited Beauvoir and more than 50 Confederate sites back in 2018. They uncovered how public money is keeping them open. Brian starts us off by running through the numbers. Beauvoir gets $100,000 every year from the Mississippi State Legislature to take care of the historic buildings. Lawmakers approved the same amount this year, in the same period that they also voted to remove the Confederate emblem from the state flag. The biggest windfall came after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. FEMA and the National Park Service sent more than $17 million to Beauvoir, But that money didn't just go to restoring buildings. Almost half of that money went to creating a new museum and library from scratch. And that's where you hear this lost cause version of history, of benevolent slave owners and heroic Confederates. We found that over the last decade, at least $40 million have flowed to Confederate sites and organizations. We visited dozens of these places, and we would often hear some version of this myth that slavery wasn't so bad. In Georgia, for example, I heard this on the tour of A.H. Stevens State Park. 
Stevens was the vice president of the Confederacy. Mr. Stevens was real good to his servants. He treated them like family. Georgia has spent over a million dollars on this park in the last decade. And then there's this in Mississippi. I've recorded it on a tour of a historic site dedicated to Stephen D. Lee, a Confederate lieutenant. They got $30,000 from the state. Uh, when it was started, a lot of widows were being taken advantage of and thrown off and different things. So their, their idea was they were going to be like a militia to protect people. She's talking about the Ku Klux Klan. She told me that the KKK had been misunderstood, that the group was formed to protect widows after the war. She left out that 19 people were lynched in the very same county where we were standing. We found that a big chunk of public money goes directly to Confederate heritage organizations, the United Daughters of the Confederacy and Sons of Confederate Veterans. Some of that money goes to maintain specific sites, like a Confederate cemetery I visited here in Virginia. I'm entering the Confederate section of Oakwood Cemetery here in Richmond, Virginia. And there's a gentleman who is, looks to be directing traffic. Can you tell me what you're doing here today and why we're here today? Yeah, today is uh, it's Confederate Memorial Day. Not to be confused with actual Memorial Day, Confederate Memorial Day is celebrated in late April. It's an official holiday in three states, an unofficial holiday in other southern states, including Virginia. And it's uh, 17,000 Confederate soldiers buried here, and we want to honor, honor our ancestors. I salute the Confederate flag with affection, reverence, and undying devotion to the cause for which it stands. That's Susan Hathaway, the founder of the Virginia Flaggers. She's the woman Seth met earlier, who called Beauvoir a holy place. She stands in front of a small crowd on a patch of the well-tended lawn, her back to a memorial obelisk erected in 1871. And if you would all join me in singing our state song, because it is still our state song, Carry Me Back to Old Virginia. Carry me back to Old Virginia. There's where the cotton and the corn and taters grow. There's where the birds warble sweet in the springtime. There's where this old darkies hard air long to go. There's where I labored so hard for old Massa. I'm standing here listening to this song, which hasn't been the state song since 1997, by the way, with lyrics like Darky and Massa. I'm the great-grandson of enslaved people in a cemetery that borders an African-American neighborhood. All of this is strange. I understand that cemeteries were and are memorial sites, places of mourning. But right after the Civil War, these burial grounds, as well as monuments, became central to the politics of those white Southerners trying to rebuild their pre-war power. Another way they reclaimed that power, they stripped black people of their newly won right to vote. Black people had largely been driven violently from the polls. Very, very few black people could vote. That's Ibram X. Kendi. He's director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at American University. Very simply, black people did not have the ability to vote out of office people who were advancing public policies to build Confederate monuments. Money from the Commonwealth of Virginia has continued to flow to these burial grounds and monuments. And they've become pilgrimage sites for Confederate sympathizers and white supremacists. Professor Kendi says when public dollars go to Confederate monuments, we all support what they stand for. Investing a single dollar in Confederate monuments is essentially investing dollars in, in racism and slavery and in white supremacy. So how much money has the public invested in Confederate cemeteries in Virginia? We went digging in the state's official archive, the Library of Virginia. We read through more than 100 years of legislative reports, all the way back to 1902. We found that Virginia taxpayers have spent about $9 million in today's dollars to fund organizations set up to take care of Confederate graves. Some of that money is channeled to the Sons of Confederate Veterans. 
Seth met up with members of the group at the same cemetery I visited. How are you, sir? This is your uh, ancestors' grave. Well, we we uh, we look after we look after, of course, all of them that we can. But that happens to be a cousin, yes. I'm here with five men. Edwin Ray is a longtime member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, and until he retired, he was a research librarian at the Library of Virginia. People talk about the, the lost cause, you know, like we're adhering to some sort of myth or something. Well, that's not the case. We are remembering the way things were supposed to be, and uh, if we lose the style of government that was handed down to us, then it is a lost cause. These men draw on carefully constructed myths about the Confederacy and about slavery and fundamentally about white innocence. Uh, granted, I'm sure there's a few plantation owners that treated their people bad, but the great majority of them didn't. Would you go buy a brand new car and take it home and beat it up with a hammer? <laughs> you know? I mean, to buy a slave back then was like buying a car today, you know? It costs a lot of money. That's Kent Morris. He's wearing a white bandana and a white T-shirt with a Southern Heritage Defense Team logo on it. Brian and I have met a lot of Sons of Confederate veterans in Virginia, in Alabama, in Kentucky, in Mississippi. They make a point to distance themselves from white supremacists. But white supremacists, including the KKK and more recently Unite the Right, have used Confederate sites as rallying points. If you let an inanimate object, like a piece of granite or marble or whatever, if that hurts your feelings, you got troubles. <laughs> you know? Morris tells me that if African Americans don't like Confederate monuments, they should just build their own. Do the same thing that our ancestors did. Get up enough money, find a place to build it, and build your own. <laughs> you know? But one way his ancestors got up enough money was by using their political power to channel taxpayer dollars to Confederate cemeteries and other sites across the South. African-American leaders have tried to stop that flow of public money from the start. Edwin Ray tells me that losing their memorial sites could lead to violence. Our preference is to fight these battles in court as we have and at the ballot box. We don't want to uh, go to war <laughs> with, with anybody, but... Our ancestors had to do that, and if we're half the men they were, it may come to a time when we have to do that as well. That warning about violence came in 2018, when Seth and Brian originally reported this story. Things have changed dramatically since then in the wake of George Floyd's death in police custody. Brian lives in Richmond, and he's been reporting on how that city, whose identity is entwined with the Confederacy, has responded in the last few months. For a long time, more than a century really, removing these monuments seemed impossible. There were resolutions, protests, meetings and commissions, and little came of these. But then, the killing of George Floyd and the movement that emerged put history on the fast track. Between June 4th when Virginia's Governor Ralph Northam announced the Robert E. Lee statue would come down to July 1st, protesters had already toppled four statues, from Christopher Columbus to Jefferson Davis. Also on July 1st, Richmond Mayor LeVar Stoney stepped in and invoked emergency powers to order the removal of all city-owned Confederate statues, the four on Monument Avenue and others across Richmond, as a matter of public safety and as the right thing to do. The great weight of that burden has fallen on our residents of color. By removing them, we can begin to heal and focus all our attention on our future. That same day, Stoney sent the cranes to the iconic statue of Confederate General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson. The crowd waited for hours through hot sun and then a torrential rainstorm. But when the last bolt that held Stonewall and his horse to the pedestal was cut, the thousands of people who remained cheered. For more than a hundred years, these statues have towered over a city that has always had a large African-American community. 
I spoke to Anna Edwards, a longtime advocate for protecting African-American historic sites. I asked her what she says to Confederate monument defenders who accuse protesters of vandalism and defacement. We have people who have shown their extreme frustration and their displeasure on inanimate objects, on property, right? That's not attacking lives because, in fact, their whole call is for the defense of human life. Pay attention to that. For now, Robert E. Lee makes a last stand as the only remaining Confederate statue on Monument Avenue in Richmond. Its defenders are fighting the statue's removal in court. The scene around the monument reflects a city in flux. At night, people had been camping out here to watch over this space. Police shut it down after recent violence broke out at another demonstration in a different part of Richmond. But during the day, people have added life to this space. Dancers and musicians perform. People play basketball at one of the hoops folks have wheeled in. And parents, particularly black parents, bring their children to pose on the heavily tagged monument. Richmonders have done more than repurpose the circle around the monument. Everyday people have rechristened the site Marcus David Peters Circle for a black man who Richmond police officers killed in 2018 while he was suffering from a mental health crisis. But even as the world changes, the money still flows. Taxpayer dollars to other monuments and memorials to the Confederacy across the South. I want to thank reporters Brian Palmer and Seth Fried Wessler of Type Investigations, our partner on today's show. Fernanda Camarena produced the original story, and Ajib Amini produced our update. When we come back, another debate over monuments that pits neighbor against neighbor. This is Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX. Hey, it's Al, and our show this week is the final chapter in our series, American Rehab. For years, we've been investigating drug rehabs that send participants to work without pay across the U.S. We identified hundreds of places like this, but there's still more out there, and we need your help finding them. If you or someone you know has experience with a program like this, we want to hear about it. To share your story, text the word REHAB to 474747. You can text STOP at any time and standard data rates apply. Again, that's REHAB to 474747. From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Edson. The monuments that activists have targeted in the last few months, they haven't all been Confederates. Protesters have also gone after statues of Spaniards who first colonized North America hundreds of years before the Civil War. In 2018, Reveal's Stan Alcorn reported on some of these monuments in New Mexico. We're going to bring you that story and then tell you what's happened since. Here's Stan. When Nora Naranjo Morse got the call to help make what would become the most controversial monument in New Mexico history, she was in the place she's most comfortable. The studio where she makes her art. I mean, who would want to be here, right? Oh, in the studio with a fireplace in the rain. It was 1997, and the director of public art for the city of Albuquerque was on the phone asking if she wanted to be part of a tricultural collaboration. There'd be a Hispanic artist, an Anglo artist, and he hoped Nora, a Tewa Indian artist from Santa Clara Pueblo. The call was so out of the blue. This was a public art project. I'd never done public art, really. This was with other people. I had been working solo. And did you say yes right then, or do you remember how the phone called? I said yes. I I said yes right away because um, I opened my mouth and I said yes. And then (laughs) afterwards I thought, oh, I wonder what this is going to be like. The assignment was to create a memorial for the Cuarto Centenario, 
a celebration of the 400th anniversary of the state's first Spanish colony and of its founder, Juan de Oñate. Viva Oñate! Nora knew of an Oñate printing company. She'd driven down Oñate Street. There's an equestrian statue of Oñate in full armor on the side of a highway near her house. But what she remembers actually learning about Oñate, the historical figure from her middle school social studies teacher, was just that he was a kind of Spanish founding father. And by the time I was in junior high and I was seeing this stuff, I thought it was okay to ask questions. What was the question you asked? Well, where are the Indians <laughs> in this? And he got sort of beat red, and he told me to be quiet and sit down. I never forgot it. It was one of those seminal moments where I realized, oh, I can't ask these questions because they'll make somebody in a place of authority uncomfortable. You can't answer Nora's question without talking about Acoma. It's one of dozens of pueblos, as the Spanish called Native American settlements, that Oñate encountered in New Mexico. The year after he founded the first colony, some of his men went to Acoma demanding food, and 13 of them were killed. In response, Oñate declared a war of blood and fire. His soldiers killed hundreds of Acoma men, women, and children. And Oñate himself sentenced the adults to 20 years of slavery and the adult men to have one foot chopped off. This was the history that Nora and I and anyone in New Mexico who followed the news was about to learn in detail. Because within a couple weeks of Nora's phone call, an envelope showed up on the desk of Larry Calloway, a columnist at the Albuquerque Journal. It was sort of a combination of a press release and a ransom note and uh, a photo. The photo was a Polaroid of a bronze boot and spur that had been chopped off the Oñate statue near Nora's house. And I read the note and it said, we took the liberty of removing Oñate's right foot on behalf of our brothers and sisters at Acoma Pueblo. We will be melting this foot down and casting small medallions to be sold to those who are historically ignorant. The note went on to say they'd done it for the 400th anniversary of the, quote, unasked-for exploration of our land. In other words, the point was to spoil the party that Nora had just become a part of. And when Larry's story came out, and it was picked up by NPR and the New York Times, that is exactly what happened. I still didn't see the storm that was coming. It was still in its infancy. Conchita Lucero was one of the founding members of a group that would fight for the Oñate statue as the New Mexico Hispanic Culture Preservation League. And for them, Oñate filled a different kind of gap in the history books. When I was a child, at 10 years of age, I asked my grandmother, who was a school teacher, I was reading the American history books, I said, did our people do anything? You know, that's how I felt. All Conchita knew was that her family had been in New Mexico for centuries, way longer than the Anglo classmates who called people like her dirty Mexicans. But it wasn't until many decades later, after she retired and joined a local genealogical society, that she started learning history by studying her family tree. She found some Native American ancestors, But she was most excited about the ones who came from Europe, way back in the 16th century, like one of Oñate's captains. You'd start finding your family members and you were going, wow, (laughs) I never knew they did all of this. Did it change how you saw yourself? Yes. I, I, I never argued that one person wasn't as good as the other, but sometimes you were made to feel inferior. And at that point, that inferiority left. And so when the Cuarto Centenario rolled around, she was in the group that met with the Albuquerque Arts Board to discuss a possible bronze statue of Oñate, the man they called the father of the Hispanic culture and our state. Was what happened at Acoma brought up? No. No. And and was it It, on your mind? 
No. Was it something that you knew about? I wasn't as versed in it as I have become. Akama today is a place where tens of thousands of tourists go to buy pottery and visit houses built centuries ago out of mud and sandstone on top of a 400-foot mesa. If you happen to fall over the edge, this is the end of your tour, and no <laughs> refunds will be given, so just keep that in mind, okay? But it's not just a tourist attraction. Most of New Mexico's pueblos disappeared after the Spanish came, but Acoma survived, and some of the 6,000 enrolled members would lead the resistance to the Albuquerque Oñate Memorial, like Elita Suazo, who goes by Tweedy. What did you know about the history of your people in that place? That we came from the underworld, on the back of Grandmother Spider. We wandered the earth, and when we got to where Akuma was, we were told this is where we're supposed to be. That's what I knew, you know, that we've been there forever. She knew that when the Spanish came, they'd done terrible things to her ancestors. But it was only when the statue foot-cutting hit the news that she learned it was this Juan de Oñate who gave the orders, and that Oñate was later banished from New Mexico by the Spanish crown for reasons including his cruelty to the innocent at Acoma. That was everybody's first awareness. And at the same time, she learned the city of Albuquerque was considering building a new monument to him. He had been cast out of New Mexico forever. And now you want to bring him back and put him on a statue? It's still mind-boggling. The city could see that another Oñate on a horse would be a bad look. Their solution was to add Nora to the project, to make it a tricultural collaboration, and to tell the three artists they had to include not only Oñate, but the settlers he brought, and the native peoples who'd been there for centuries. But when Nora showed up to the first meeting, the other two artists wheeled in a model they'd already put together, and it was Oñate on a horse. One of them suggested Nora could work on the pedestal beneath the horse's hooves. I felt insulted. I felt hurt. I felt marginalized. I uh, didn't think I could do that. Although in myself, I was thinking that there was a solution, that art could tell a story that was truthful. It brought her back to that middle school social studies class, asking the uncomfortable question, but she was able to get them to scrap this idea and start over. And then she started getting calls from other Pueblo people. They were asking her to quit in protest. I didn't do that. Uh, And when I refused, I think people were disappointed. But I realized that um, by me staying in the game, I would at least be able to fight for that voice that I think was so important. Not just my artistic voice, but the voice of these people that had gone through this incredible experience that changed their culture completely. And uh, I kept going back to those things. The memorial had become this very public test of whether New Mexico was the land of tricultural harmony that it claimed to be. But as the year of the Cuarto Centenario, 1998, came and went, Nora and the other artists stopped speaking to each other. And the project went from one artwork to two, a series of bronze sculptures of Spanish settlers, including Oñate, and a land art installation that was Nora's response. The whole thing would take up most of a city block and cost over a half a million dollars. Now the question was, did the city want it? This is GOV 14, and now from Government Center in downtown Albuquerque, the Albuquerque City Council. The council chambers were packed. The public seating was divided like a pep rally or Congress. 
We will move uh, to public comments now. On the pro Oñate side was a group of older Hispanic men and women. John Lucero. Like Conchita and her husband, John. Those of you that are have Spanish ancestry should be angry. This is a personal attack on you, your family, and your heritage. The anti Oñate side. Gracias. Next. Was a lot younger. Good evening, student council, our city council members. And more diverse. Allow me to introduce myself. I am a Chicana. And I want to express a Jewish perspective. I am a mestiza of mixed people. Oñate does not represent the best of my culture. You are not representing me. And I just want to say that I'm sorry that you and a small group of Hispanics in this room feel like they have to slam another people's culture in order to feel pride. Dozens of people spoke. But at the forefront, leading the movement, were women from ACMA. Hello, everybody. How are you? Like Tweety Suazo. I didn't know that the awful things that happened to my people happened to my people until this statue became an issue. I'm really tired of being used as tourists, and our wares are the only things that matter in this community. I'm begging you, don't do this to my people. Don't hurt them this way. It's not right. Thank you very much. Last speaker, I.L. Sanchez Davis. This fight had been going on for three years, and people on all sides were demanding a decision. The memorial was a compromise, the city councilors kept saying. Oñate would not be named, he would not be on a horse. And the alternative, not building anything? If they did that, they'd be saying this whole multicultural, historical, commemorative experiment had been a failure. So they voted. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? No. They voted seven to two to build the memorial. That motion passes. We worked so hard. Tweety Suazo. And it just, it just, it's, it didn't matter. It didn't matter what we said. It didn't matter what we do. It didn't matter that we educated. It just didn't matter. The memorial was quietly unveiled five years later. More than two dozen life-sized bronze figures, men and women, oxen and sheep, trudging up a sandy hill. And at the front, you'll see Oñate in a cape and helmet looking in the general direction of a security camera that may or may not be pointed at his feet. And then next to all that is what looks from above like a huge dirt spiral. You kind of have to experience it which is why I met Nora Naranjo Morse there to walk into the artwork she's titled Numbi Huage, Our Center Place. When you come down on this path, it's symbolic that you're coming into your own center place. You're coming... As the dirt path spirals counterclockwise, you walk down into the ground. The street disappears behind the hills of desert shrubs on either side, then the buildings, then Oñate himself... Until finally, at the center of the center place, if you sit down, all you see is desert and water trickling across a rock. And I like that very much because I think that's what it was like a long time ago. That's how I interpret the past. It's a glimpse of a world before Oñate arrived. But it's also intended as a confrontation between two totally different worldviews. Because as you walk back out of the spiral... This is what you see. The telephone lines, the sculpture of Oñate coming here, looking north, the stoplight, it's all there. And so you see that in some ways when they came, they brought us great opportunity, but at such a high cost. The brutal colonization was forever affecting to us. And I think... We should never forget that. And she hopes that some of the people who come to see Oñate and the Spanish settlers will step into her artwork, too, and see what she sees. 
reveals Stan Alcorn brought us that story in 2018. If you visit the monument in Albuquerque today, you'll see something different. Here's Stan again. For Nora, it started on a Monday in June with an email about the equestrian statue down the road in Alcalde. And do you remember what the message said? Uh, it's happening now, Alcalde, Oñate. <laughs> and I knew exactly what they were talking about. By the time she pulled up in her pickup, there was a small crowd on the side of the highway, people watching and recording with their phones. Share the video. It's just something historic right now. They watched as county workers drove a forklift up under Oñate's horse. And it's coming down. The forklift just came in and scooped him up and just drove off down the road with him. The county said they took the statue down to protect it from a protest planned for that afternoon. But there was a much larger protest happening that night, two hours south in Albuquerque, where Oñate was still standing. I could tell it had the potential to be explosive. The Albuquerque protest started with people sitting on blankets in a park, listening to speeches from people like Tweety Suazo. This man had his knee on the necks of indigenous people. But a group of younger activists started gathering across the street, around the statue of Oñate. Where they were confronted by a group of men in camo carrying rifles, a militia founded by a former neo-Nazi that calls itself the New Mexico Civil Guard. New Mexico Civil Terrorists! This protest made national news, thanks less to the militia than to a man named Stephen Baca. Video shows him throwing female protesters to the ground. And then, after being chased from the crowd, prosecutors say he took a handgun from his shorts and fired, wounding protester Scott Williams. Shots fired! Shots fired! The next morning, Albuquerque did what the county up north had done the day before. They sent workers with heavy equipment to remove Oñate, saying it was for public safety. The city put up a survey online asking what they should do next— with the statue of Oñate and with the statues of settlers and soldiers that were left behind. And people ask Nora what she thinks, too. And it's not binary because it's, for me, not that simple. She's already thinking about what happens after the statues are removed or replaced or contextualized with a plaque and how this piece of public art about history could still work. If people learn about its history, protests and all. Now, whether that happens or not, that's, <laughs> you know, that's another story. But we can always hope. That story was from Reveal's Stan Alcorn. Our show was produced by Fernanda Camarena, Stan Alcorn, and Ajiba Mini. Our executive producer, Kevin Sullivan, edited the show along with Jen Chian and Esther Kaplan. Thanks to Type Investigations, our partner on today's show. We had research help from Jasper Craven, Aaron Holloway-Palmer, and Richard Salame. And thanks to Delaney Hall and Hannah Colton for their work on the ground in New Mexico. Our production manager was Mwende Inahosa. Our sound design team is the dynamic duo, Jay Breezy, Mr. Jim Briggs, and Fernando, my man, Yo Aruda, who also composed the original score for this hour. They had help from Joe Plort, Garrett Tiedemann, and Caitlin Benz. Our senior supervising editor is Taki Telenitis. Our CEO is Krista Scharfenberg. Matt Thompson is our editor-in-chief. Our theme music is by Camarado, Lightning. Support for reveals provided by the Reva and David Logan Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Heising Simons Foundation, the Democracy Fund, and the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. Reveal is a co-production of the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX. I'm Al Letson. And remember, there is always more to the story.